spoken lately. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I have a dream that at the moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed of waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I haven't walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, since I held up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Ambien's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label. Hi, it's Andy Ann from Spoken Label. A spoken Label was originally set up at the beginning of 2016 and records show it started off really as a one-off podcast chatting to writers, poets and artists. Over time, it became monthly, then weekly and occasionally nowadays it goes on that to a more regular basis. To date, I've done over 330 sessions and I'm always looking for new poets, writers, artists, singer-songwriters, general interesting creative people to come onto the podcast. You can find this on all the usual networks over Apple, iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Podbay and dozens of others. But it does have a central database of spoken label, which is all one word, dot bandcamp.com. Obviously now, to help me with the running costs of this podcast, I'm always grateful for any kind of donation to assist me with it. You can even do the donation through the Bandcamp page by putting in a fee to download one of the free podcasts, or send it over to my PayPal to aen1mpo at yahoo.co.uk. My email address again is aen1mpo at yahoo.co.uk. So enjoy the podcast. Take care. Bye. Spoken Label. Hi guys, Andy N. Spoken Label. Back in the house on a Sunday evening and it's bloody freezing as well. So we're over to Wigan today to meet a fantastic poet that I've met twice over the last couple of years, one way or another, and she's fantastic. I'm not even going to introduce her. I'm going to leave you all dangling in suspense. So, mystery guests, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell the people obviously who you are and where your creativity originally came from. Want to start from there? Okay, hi, I am Louise Fazakale. I am a poet and interdisciplinary artist from Wigan. Um, where does my creativity come from? I think it strongly comes from being from a family of Irish and uh, Romany descent. Um, in my family, it, as a child, you are kind of expected to make a little show and get up and sing and dance in front of all the relations. Um, and I was a huge, huge reader. So I think the mix of um, being expected and encouraged to kind of perform and absolutely loving reading and stories is probably where my creativity comes from. Yeah, yeah. I've been, been reading up before and it does. It's, it's like really like it's, and I'm similar to you in a way, like I started when I was about 10 and I'm 50 now. So it's like it's, when it gets going, it gets you into your system as a kid. It just never lets go sometimes, does it? If you do it once you get going with it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that um, I didn't really realise I was a creative person, though, until I'd never really heard the word creative until, um, like, much into my adulthood. Um, mm. But I remember being at, like, secondary school and asking the teachers, because I weren't sure what to do for my A-levels, what do you think I should do? Do you think I should do, like, English and arts subjects or sciences? Because I just wasn't sure. And my science teacher just went, oh, no, Louise, don't do science. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I was oh yeah, I had the same thing myself because I guess and I remember I've, I've got a story. There's there's a lot I could. I said well, I said well, you've got Louise in some ways where I'm in the same boat as you because they hated me as science because I kept blowing up the lab. <laughs> they kept going to make all these bomb you know, stink bombs and stuff, and I kept setting the desks on fire with the old Bunsen burners they used to have. 
<laughs> accidentally. And I was saying at the time, no, oh, Andrew, Andrew, stick to creative writing. Even though they told my mum and dad at the time, his, his writing's only very average. I think they were more afraid I was going to blow the laps up, probably. So. <laughs> well. I remember asking um, the science teacher a question, um, what is fire made of? And I thought it was a really interesting <laughs> question. and he, just was, he wasn't interested. Um, maybe it was more of an arty question than a science question. <laughs> yeah, I can well relate to that. Now, obviously, in relation to yourself, obviously, I know you, you obviously, um, I know you've done, you did your degree originally, didn't you, over at Lancashire University. And you, do, you did theatre studies and creative writing. I, I did a man at Bolton, actually, so I, I can relate to that again. And then, obviously, like you did what my wife did, and we got an MA in creative writing as well at Edge Hill University. Did you ever envisage, obviously, when you got your year, when you went to university, what where your career would go afterwards at the time? Definitely not. I didn't go to with a view to be being in a creative profession. I thought that I'd go to university, get a degree, and then do some sort of management training program. And the only reason I'd chosen drama or theatre studies was because I'm very much motivated by a group. So I knew if I was working in a group and I had to be there for mm. rehearsals and stuff, I'd managed to do my degree. Whereas ah. um, originally I took English and I wasn't turning up for any of the lectures. I wasn't doing anything. Um, so for me, it was a little bit of the only way I can get through this university experience is by doing something where other people are relying on me. So no, I, I didn't think I would do anything arty. And in fact, I left uh, the world of arts for about 10 years after I graduated. I just had normal jobs. Oh, did you? Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So, wow. Like I said, obviously then, um, I know obviously that I said people are people are researching this one, but I know obviously then you went into where well, you got eventually got to your verbs, the New Voices Commission, didn't you? So what led you to want to do Love is a Backlefield? Well, um, so it's kind of all wrapped up in why I started writing because I did write at university for my degree, but mm. I didn't really take it seriously. I was only really writing for an academic purpose rather than a human yeah. purpose. Um, but when I turned about 30, I had two very tiny children and I was at home all the time looking after them. And at that point in my life, I discovered the need to write. Um, so I started writing and then... Uh, writing poetry and then a couple of years later my, uh, the father of my children he was a soldier he went away to Afghanistan and while he was in Afghanistan um, I kind of realized that lots of people don't really know what it's like to be a modern soldier or about modern warfare because the rest of the world was just going on normal around me but for me I had a phone call like every week or every two weeks from Afghanistan where like the father of my children was at risk of death. And like we live in a society where we're taught to put seatbelts on, you know, just in case you crash. And, and it seems very in opposition to then being in the army and your job is to go and risk your life. So I wrote Love is a Battlefield all about our family's experience of war, just because I kind of felt people didn't really understand. Yeah, yeah, it's a tremendous show, it is. And like I said, like I've seen, I've read enough of it and seen bits and pieces and know to know it's just, Incredible. And then obviously that, that really led one thing led to another then really, didn't it, for you? Said that you can argue the bulk of them bit them, didn't it, good and proper. So, so I know you took it yeah. over to Edinburgh, didn't you, at the point, not long after that as well. I did, but what was significant for me was I'd been working part-time. Um, so I had, my I had my small children, so I was working part-time. And alongside the part-time job, I was doing all these arty things. And I got the opportunity to tap voluntary redundancy, and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to take volunteer redundancy. Mm. I'm just going to try and do it full time, being my arty. And um, as luck would have it, I, I took the redundancy. And the same week, I got the email from BBC New Voices to say that they'd selected my piece. So it was a really good start to my freelance career. Oh, yeah. it's I'm always a believer in this sort of thing where it's like life, I think, is preordained for us in one way or another. And it's like, that's obviously a fantastic example. I'm, I've had to read about that. And it's like it's all everything that just coincides together at the right time, isn't it? Really, so that's why I was always sliding doors to an army straight away with that. Oh, well done. 
Well, it's a strange thing, isn't it, when we think about existence and different planes of existence and you wonder what is coincidence and what is luck. I think it's quite like whether or not we're in a matrix. Sometimes I do think I wonder if we are like in a augment, you know, augmented reality and we're not really in control of ourselves. I don't think about it seriously as such, but those thoughts pass through and sometimes that sort of thing's re reflected in my work. Yeah, yeah, you can see it when... I think I want to go. I better move on to your books anyway, because I've I've read obviously your first and your third collection, the Lolitas and the Pleasure Dome, but and I'm it's certainly if people want to go hold both these books, I think they're fantastic both of them because I can see the real the playfulness in both writing. But it's like, and it's one to think about. Way really, it took me a couple of reads on both of them to realise they actually are linked together, really, aren't they? As well, that's why because yeah. They Tell they, us they about, tell us about that process. Together. Yeah. Sorry, Andy, go on. No, no, I said, my fault. I was thinking, yes, my brain, because I'm dyspraxic, my brain sometimes slows down. <laughs> it don't mean to. But yeah, tell us about the, the, way, the way these two books are linked together then, first of all then. Oh, okay, so I wrote the letters all about um, thinking about the question, what power does a teenage girl have? Um, so that was the, the key question at the centre of the Lolitas and I was thinking about like the amazing power of people like Greta Thunberg and like Joan of Arc you know like what power do um, teenage girls have but one of the triggers for it was one of my friends was groomed when she was a teenager yeah. and mm -hmm. I met her when she was um, 17 and so the guy who groomed her was still abusing her and I knew him and I thought their relationship was kind of normal, even though he was so much older than now. Because when you're 17, you don't really know right from wrong. Um, you know a bit, but not really. Um, so she was prosecuting the guy who groomed her. And I was just thinking about what power I had as a teenage girl with like all these different boys I was snugging and you know, and what power I didn't have. And so that was kind of the key to that, and because I had young teenagers at the time, like 11 and 12 year olds, I was just wondering what the future would look like for them. So that was kind of at the heart of the first book. And then when I was writing The Pleasure Dome, it wasn't really supposed to be linked initially. Mm. It was supposed to be an exploration of um, the brain and the things that make us happy and the things that make us feel nothing. You know, looking at the extremes of human existence about depression and anhedonia and hedonism and about drinking and dancing and going out. Like, I wanted to explore those things. But as I was writing the book, it was during lockdown. And mm. um, my girls were getting older. And one of my girls was really poorly. Um, and she, her mental health was terrible over lockdown. She began to self-harm. And I was noticing the aging process for myself. So then the second book ended up actually taking my thoughts around myself as a mother, around teenage girls, and still about kind of drinking and dancing and going out because that was like a book from an aging perspective almost. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. So in the real world, that's kind of links the poetry. But also in both books, I explore this sort of dystopian fictional world with characters in it. And in the first book, I'm looking at the characters of um, Lola and Alice, who are a bit like Lolita and Alice in Wonderland. And they're being educated by this big screen in the kind of bedroom, which we didn't know was going to happen like so realistically in lockdown because it was prior to that. And then in the second book, Lolita's... Um, grown a lot older and she's become it's almost it's not a sex worker it's a little bit like being a sex worker in a, in a gentleman's club but instead of selling sex they sell the use of their organs so the punters come into the club and they hook up um to a candidate or like the girls who work there or the boys who work there and they share their organs so the rich punter gets to have all the drink and drugs they want but they don't get have to experience any of the uh, nasty physical after effects the person they're hooked up to does that and um, so yeah. that's kind of the progression of the story of the characters really yeah yeah it's 
I think it's quite, it, it's weird because I get, I found it absolutely disturbing in places, but also made me smile in places. Well, it was a really quite fine line that you went on that book, and it was a really major success on it straight away. Like, I did love the fact in it as well where you were doing a lot, um, I counted like, we started doing some quite traditional poetic forms in it as well, but you give it that sort of different use as well. Like, I know you did a couple of sonnets in there as well. It's like, for ex just an example as well. Like, it was like, I, and I loved her example as well. Another one was one of my favorite pieces was the kitchen. The kitchen stinks actually, where he did it like we did half the poem straight down at what on the left hand side, and he carried it on on the right hand side. Almost like it was like he moved it in a different direction when you brought Debbie Harry mentioned into it. But how it's it's really quite an experimental book this one. So, and um, yeah, I know you see you've said elsewhere that like you you were glad you were your publishers at. Obviously, you did this book with because you're not sure whether it'd be a different book with another publisher, probably, wouldn't it? I feel. Yeah, I think that uh, a couple of things were at play there. In uh, when I was, so I did my master's quite late on. So I did my degree like at the normal time, if you can call it that, you know, when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Mm. But I only did my master's a couple of years ago. And the oh. reason I did my, my master's was because I had all this writing and I'd not actually published a book. So I had a successful career, really, as a performance poet, mm. but didn't have any books to go alongside it. So I went to do my master's to give me some structure to kind of force me to put some books together. And and one of the beautiful things about my master's is that it um, introduced me to more experimental poetry. So it meant mm. I felt I didn't have to just write for performance. I could also write in an experimental way. And I could also write in a more visual way. So that yeah. stuff that I was writing didn't have to live on the pages of a book. It might become an art installation. Um, yeah, so that was quite same. fun. And in the kitchen stinks, that kind of um, is a technique that I used in the Lolitas in one of my poems as well, where I set the verses out like columns in a newspaper. Yeah, and the idea that. being that you could read it downwards if you wanted to. Or you could read it across and it would still kind of make a fragmented kind of sense. Yeah, it was very surreal. I loved it for that. Now, the use of illustrations in the book, I think, is really quite striking as well. But obviously, we're talking about the, the image of the brain piece, which, again, is a form of poetry itself. Now, obviously, if people look at the front cover, they will notice, if you're really observant, it was um, the artist that did... The Frankie Goes to Hollywood album, then um, Welcome to the Pleasure Dome, did the artwork for that view as well. Tell us about then how this happened then. Because it's, I think it's an amazing, well, it was, it's amazing. Uh, people might not know, different publishers work in different ways, but I am a little, I wouldn't say I'm a control freak, but I do like have an artistic vision. <laughs> And yeah, I kind of really do with this. <laughs> I kind of want to control them, those elements of it. So with the first book, The Lolitas, um, I, I was really interested in continuous line drawing at the time. So I was looking all over the internet for a continuous line drawing that I felt would work for the cover. I found a girl who was working in New York. I loved to work. I emailed her and said, please can I buy this design off you and use it for my books? And, and, and then we took it and used it. Now, with The Pleasure Dome, it was a little bit different because the title of the book obviously refers to, in some ways, Sir Frankie and Goes to Hollywood album, The Pleasure Dome. Um, and I, when I was reading a lot about Frankie Goes to Hollywood, because I, I wanted to write something that kind of bounced off either um, Holly Johnson, the lead guy, or the band or something, because I liked how in Frankie Goes to Hollywood, um, they mention Kubla Khan, which was a Roman, um, you know, from Romantic Poets. And I just kind of like the these sort of loose intertextual kind of references. So when I was researching about Frankie Goes to Hollywood, I found out that the cover for that album had got banned because it was just too filthy. Um, and I have I'm, I'm, that I'm old enough to remember the original video. And I get just like I was about 13 at the time, and he used to come on top of the pops, and my, mum, my dad was that disgusted by it. He went and turned the TV off right in front of me and my younger sister. <laughs> like, well, yeah, because it's it's all shocking it was. Thinly, re thinly veiled references to sex and stuff. Yeah. And that was like really brave at the time, it was like a gay man, a gay scouser. And 
So when I found out that had happened with the album cover, I thought, oh, mm. and I found out who had designed it. And then I Googled the guy, uh, um, Low Call. Uh, I found some more of his work and he'd done um, an article, for, he'd illustrated an article for The Guardian about kink. And there was this image there of this eye. And I thought, oh, this is serendipity because in the both of the books, I talk about, and, and it's a popular dystopian kind of um, trope almost, the idea of eyes and being watched. And as a woman, you are watched and looked yes, at. And um, so the, the symbol of the eye just goes all the way through it. And I'd seen he'd done this design of the eye. So I just emailed him and his agent and said, can I use it on the front of my book? And he was like, yeah, if you want. So I bought, you know, the image and um, so I could use it. But it just shows you sometimes, doesn't it? Like it's going back to what we said about it, it's just sliding doors thing. It's just like you suddenly see things by chance and yeah, it really added something to the book and it's like it's it really is it's a tremendous book, no two ways about it with that one. So how was this in, in fact obviously because I knew you originally as a performance poet, how have you been actually how has it been trying to perform these pieces then? Has it been a real challenge for you? Well, some of them are written for performance. So I've got one called Full Body Holly Suit, which is about wanting to be like Holly Johnson. And that is very much bog standard, easy to understand. Mm. You could do it in a, a music festival where everyone's drunk and people would get it. Yeah. So at one end of the spectrum, there's that very obvious work that is very easy to perform. It's rhyming, it's rhythmic. Um, and then at the other end, I've got like, they're not haiku, they're senryu, because haiku is often about landscape, but senryu is about human behaviour, but they're still the same haiku form. I've got them that look more like the actual images in it because they're um, coming out of the brain, there's illustrations of the brain. Um, but somewhere in between, I've got stuff that's a little bit more dense. So quite a lot of the work is suitable for performance, but you talked about the sonnets, the sonnet cycle I wrote, set in the bathroom, to me, they're not really good performance material. They're too experimental. I don't think if you were just hearing it without reading the rest of the book, you'd even get what was going on. Um, so with that material, I've been working with um, a dance artist and video artist to try and explore having more dance and physicality in some of my performances. So the performance itself becomes more abstract. It's not storytelling as such. It's something a little bit different. Yeah, I know. God, I've forgotten who it is now. I did know a London poet that I did a lot of work with DV8, improvised dance theatre. I've forgotten who it was now as well. Like it's bad my bad my memories, but yeah, it's I think doing what you're doing there, it does basically you take things in a radically different way, it doesn't it? They argue, don't you, like with music, putting music with poetry, it make makes stops poetry, you may want black and white to colour, but do it with dance theatre. I think it like turns it into like a rainbow nearly. <laughs> oh, that's an awesome metaphor. I hope you remember later on what poet that worked with DVA. Because I oh, love no, DVA. It's, it's bugging me now and I've got off to, I'll come back to you off my because there is somebody I know someone that did it. I can't think of who it is. Anyway, move on. We'll move on anyway, right? So because I'm going to be, it's one of those ones where I don't have to do a podcast today for you, Louise. I'm sat there for 20 minutes trying to think who it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, not yeah. quite like, so. But anyway, oh, I want to ask curious, and obviously, is this going to be the direction you want to move into next? And obviously, you say you've been working with theatre troops, that you're working with theatre or poetry. Um, so, this is, I feel this is what, when I was young, when I was a little girl, if you'd have asked me what job do you want to do, you know, when I was a very little girl, hmm. I would have said, either I want to be a ballet dancer or a vet and then we never had money to go to ballet school so I think I've always been a bit of a frustrated dancer now I did discover dance like when I was at college doing contemporary dance and absolutely loved it and two of my friends from my course went to audition for London uh, Northern School of Contemporary Dance and I should have gone and I chickened out so there's always a little bit of me that is a frustrated dancer and um, so I applied to the Arts Council and got the Develop Your Creative Practice funding to say, you know, can you give me some money, please, to kind of exploring, putting more dance in my work, but also having a look at physical theatre. 
So with the pleasure done specifically, I am exploring that. So I've got like one piece where it's my voice uh, and it's recorded over the Twin Peaks soundtrack. Oh, I saw that. Um, I saw that mentioned in the book about Twin Peaks. Yeah, how fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so like Twin Peaks is a reference that runs through it because like the work's been described as surreally council estate, which I quite love. <laughs> I yeah, I do as fire. well, yeah. It's almost like you can argue the book's Twin Peaks on a council estate. Yeah, I can see that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. um, so like... Um, I, like, I always like it when things link to other things. So in that piece, it's called Mirror Princess Die, uh, not Princess Diana. Uh, um, I, um, I've actually just kind of performed dance while the, the track plays, you know, rather than speaking. And then in another piece, like in The Kitchen Stinks, I speak and then a, like a music track comes in and I do a bit of dancing. And then in another piece called Open, where I exp well, it's a poem about the Open Music Archive and I'm looking at the idea of circles in music, like this, the circular shape of the record and the circular shape of you, the pupil in your eye and the circular shape of a tree when you cut it through and you can count the rings. Um, so in that piece, um, I do, some of it's recorded and some of it's me speaking. So I'm just beginning to kind of just develop what I do so it's a little bit more theatrical. Yeah, I think it's always I always a belief in creativity. You've got to be constantly evolving anyway. It's like and you you're a fantastic example of it, really are. Like it's like it's I think obviously like you don't you think you're already ready, like you you always want to be a ballet dancer younger. Why not move into that direction now with your poetry? No, oh, brilliant, good luck with it, Louise, definitely. So what we'll do is we'll wrap up this bit now anyway. I want to give you a chance to read out a few pieces for the second half anyway. So and I'll say people are wondering they can't see this, you're stroking your cat at the moment at the top there as well. So the cat needs maximum attention. Yeah, I'm 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 suddenly aware that she started purring, so I'm gonna stop so she doesn't um but the cat um appears a lot in the book. But one of the other things I reference is the <laughs> the film Coraline. Um, oh, I Coraline love that film. I love that film. I love yeah. books. The book's even better. It's my favourite Neil Gaiman book, that one by some distance. Oh, it's tremendous. Well, I've not read the book and I need to read the book. So all my references are at the film. And, but like in Coraline, you know, the girl has the other mother with yeah. the button eyes. And when um when my daughter was quite poorly and we were beginning mm. to detach from each other, which parents do anyway for yeah, teenage yeah. girls, but it's quite a distressing experience when you've had a little girl who wants to climb in bed with you and cuddle you, and then all of a sudden, if you sit on the end of the bed, they're like, get off me bed, you pedo, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? I don't understand. Um, so it feels like the little girl that you had is gone, and, and you become something else. So that kind of, to me, tapped into the idea of Coraline. Um, and the cat is in Coraline. And we've got two cats. And yes. um, I quite enjoy pretending to be a cat in some of my poems and a meow a bit and all that kind of thing. So <laughs> it's relevant. Oh, right. I'll tell you what, Louise. We'll let you do the hard sell. So if people want to get hold of your books, which we've talked about anything else, you'll, where do you recommend they go? Well, if you um, look on my website, louisethepoet.co.uk, you can just Google, really, Wigan Poet Louise, and I'll just pop up on all the Google searches. But on my website, I've got a page called Buy Stuff, and all my books are there, um, and also my CD. You know, if you're old school and you want a CD, that's there as well. Not bought, I've not bought a CD in about 10 years, actually. <laughs> so <did you>? I'm a... <laughs> I think they're coming back. It's like vinyl; they'll come back again. Oh, I don't. Know. Well, it's, I know. I know people in bands, and they're all selling cassettes at the moment. So, it's like CDs, would be the next one, basically. <laughs> so, when we gotta get tapes pressed quicker, the CDs definitely. So, <laughs> anyway, Louise, we'll let you go and get. We'll get a few poems ready in the second half. So, been grateful on this today. Looking forward to part two. See you all. Two minutes. Spoken Label. Hi, guys. Andy N. Spoken Label, the wonderful. And I'm, I'm going to never, never get your surname right here, Louise, because I'm very careful I said this. The wonderful Louise Facaselli. So over to Louise now. She's going to do a few points for us. This dyslexia is kicking in. <laughs> over to you, Louise. <laughs> oh, thank you, Andy. Um, okay, so I thought maybe I'd share this poem first called False ID. 
um, in this poem, um, I, I saw like a big list of Victorian slang and I thought, oh, it's really interesting to kind of use this, these old Victorian words because the things that are happening between me and my daughter as happening over the ages between many mothers and many daughters. So that's part of the reason I wanted to use the words, but also the platform. Okay, false ID. 10.30 p.m. curfew. Here she is, tight as a boiled owl. She tries to slope in and up to her cell, but I call her in to bitch the pot. What's the tea? Stop child stop growing up to your room poked up from snogging at the end of the terrace oh i've tried to police cupids kettle drums those beached moon jellyfish are dangerous could poke you in the eye skirt the delicate tentacles of ego shoved into the pockets of a black hooder zip it up i say What's the point, I think? Where has my giggle mug gone? She's just a sauce box on a stick now. Mariward. There's been some drama tonight, Mum. Teenage lads dicking about with their swords. The wannabe skinny dipper of lords. Same as what happened to me, my mum and those gone before. But what else can I do when she's got the mobs? Thank you. Fantastic. Now, I had, <clears throat> my first girlfriend actually was a cockney in London, so I te I didn't I I at the time because I was very young, very really young. I know I learned a lot of London cockney slang, and you find like over time a lot of this sort of language has vanished or completely. So, so it's really interesting. You do pieces like that because you're looking back at the use of language and how it relates to nowadays. So that's straight away. So. Did you find that, was that quite a piece you have to do a lot of research on? Um, not really. I just had this list. Uh, I don't know if I found the list, actually. And it just had all these different terms on, you know, like um, uh, tight as a boiled yeah. owl, like meaning really drunk and, yeah. and poked up, um, which sounds like it kind of could mean like pregnant, but it doesn't really mean pregnant. <laughs> Um, so I just and I thought I just thought they were like Cupid's kettle drums for boobs, and I talk about boobs in different ways quite a lot in the book. So I thought that was quite fun. And um, but also the word mobs, she's got the mobs. You know, like we sometimes think mental health issues are kind of like new, but they just had all different words, didn't they? Like when I was younger, I remember people talking about oh they suffer with the nerves, and obviously in Victorian times, the idea of having the mobs which I also like because within the word mobs is the word orb. And um, at, at lots of, there are lots of spherical shapes in the book, you know, like the idea of obviously the eyeball, but also the snow globe and also the orange. And those are kind of spherical sh and the globe as in like the world globe. Um, so they crop up again and again in my poems. So that was a little thing for me that I liked. Yeah, I know, it's brilliant, no, great idea. It's like, it's shit, it's really doing sort of that thing like that. It's really worth writing. <clears throat> it's worth bearing in mind, like, you do something like that, you can really make it work different ways. Oh, it's a tremendous space. So, anyway, better like, get into piece number two. We're going to be here all night, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so, this next piece, I've decided to read it because mm. um, it doesn't get a lot of outing, as in, it's I, I think it's quite a sad piece. So sometimes if I'm performing live, I just won't do this piece either because I don't want to feel sad or because I feel like it's a little bit much for other people. So this is a little bit of a trigger warning. It does mention self-harm and mentions thinking about suicide, but it's not very, it's not very, it's not graphic at all. I'm just letting you know in case that you're listening and that's something that you don't want to hear. Um, but I do perform this piece when I do this bathroom specific piece. So I've got like a 10 minute piece with like five poems in that is, has been made to do inside like the, the toilets in a bathroom nightclub. And I do actually do this piece in there, but I do it from inside the cubicle. So the audience are outside and I shut the door of the cubicle and you can't see me, you can just hear my voice. Um, but that's the only time it gets an outing, which I don't get booked for that show a lot. Anyway, I'll just do it, it's called Daughter. Daughter. 
I feel like my daughter is dead. I look at those photos where she gazes off shot, hand under her chin, or chases me on the swing that spins in a circle like a puppet. And where is she now? She is gone. Like she's died and she is thinking about dying. It hurts so much she wants to die. I think I didn't do a good job of putting a release button in for all those feelings she has. Like that big float we bought shaped like a big pizza slice and the plug got stuck in. It has no release and so she pops herself the waterproof skin. She slices it and blood comes out. And I don't know if the feelings come out because she won't speak to me. Like I'm a big black useless leech in the corner of her room and I hate it because I don't understand what the fuck is going on. I think the, the use of the F word at the end of it really gives that a real weightiness to me straight away with that, Louise. It does. It's a great piece, that one. So how did your daughters react to that piece when you first showed it? It's a strange situation, really, because like when mm. um, you talked about Love is a Battlefield and when I wrote yeah. all that poetry for Love is a Battlefield about our mm. family's experience of war, and mm. obviously I asked my partner, like the kid's dad, if it was okay for me to write about that, and he read it and it was fine. No, with the Lolitas, I wrote a little bit about the girls. Like I wrote about one of the girls' first kisses, and I wrote oh, yeah. about another one uh, coming home from science class and telling me all about some boy being excited because there was a woman giving birth on in science, and he was like, "I was just looking at a bit." Um. So with this book, to be perfectly honest, the girls haven't read it. Like they're not interested in my work. And I know that to some extent I'm sharing personal space, personal things against them. But to be honest, you wouldn't know which one it was really. You know, I've got more than one daughter. Yeah. Um, I've not actually, I've not asked them or shown them because it's about my feelings really rather than theirs at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm hoping that, because obviously we've come through the very bad stage. We're in a much better place now. Everyone is like mentally health there. You know, one's suicidal, no one's thinking about self harming. You know, like it's we're in a, a much mm. stronger place now. Um, and I'm hoping that there'll be a time in the future that we can kind of discuss this time. Um, but it was for me, it was partly about dealing with it. Like poetry was a way of actually dealing with this horrible, horrible stuff. Yeah, I think you might find in time to come with it's a general tour, this one, because like it's, um, I didn't mention before, I've, I told you off mic before, I've got, I've got a nearly 15 year old nephew. And he's actually just started writing poetry. He has, and I've seen two of them, and I've sort of sat there thinking, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like it's, you don't know what your children do. Like you might find yourself in a couple of years' time, you might end up with one or both of your daughters get a writer before you know it. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. They might do. And like one of my daughters, I'm hot. She's really into art, um, and um, and her art is just like fabulous. So I'd be really excited if she pursued that a little bit. But they never do what you want them to do, do they? they? Just do what they want, which is fine. No, they've got minds of their own. Certainly, not in my nephew's <laughs> cases, and I do, you won't mind, me, won't mind me saying this. The two pieces I've seen are basically rap metal pieces. <laughs> so I think I think he's probably going to end up forming a rap metal band in a couple of years' time. But we'll see anyway. So, okay, Louise, um, how many more pieces should we go for today then? For with you. Do you want me to read one more? You should do one more then, yeah. I think it's a good, good, good turn to wrap up, isn't it? So, yeah, give us give us the big finale then. <laughs> this is a much lighter piece. Um, I can hear my phone ringing in the background. Is it recording for you? Can you hear it or not? No, no, no. Good, no, that's fine then. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> just ignore it. You know, just like, oh, no. Um, okay. oh, well, so I'll, leave like, I'll we'll leave this in. It shows you people have life. It is today. Yeah, so. it really is. Nice. <laughs> um, so... Um, this is about me being a teenager, really, um, and about going out and clubbing and loving it. Um, it's called The Playhouse. The Playhouse. 5 a.m., your friends, feathered, leathered and fine, finally disperse to eat donna meat like worms in threadbare taxis off to flock in warm beds we walk instead 
gargoyle, wall owls, early blurts. The clocks have spun flat hazardly into the absurd. I part starling, iridescent eyed and strip light pale. Peck, peck, peck in two high heels. The syncopated jungle jangle of your keys. We slip through the wrought iron gates of the park. A secret garden of empty swings, roost on the bandstand, smoking spells and dog ends. I was here, trying to nest in the faraway tree, my ugly bob, my cord dungarees, vicar, misplacing her virginity. Tail feathers bumping in low slung jeans, chewing gum in your hair. And amongst the dregs of shots and alcohol pops, I don't care if Monday's black. In this almost magic night come day, 6am already. Kiss me, kiss me, kiss me. That's fantastic, that, Louise. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great way of finishing off because we've been talking about having that over generations and talking about your life as another generation. It's a great way of finishing off that. That's a tremendous piece. Absolutely. I could see what you were like as it was even your daughter's age back then. So, and it's like, I know I was like that age myself. It's like, you get that stage now, we're at that age, aren't we? Look back and think of ourselves like, I don't even recognize myself when I was a teenager in old days. No, you're right. I've, um, in Lolita's, I went into my old diaries because I wrote a diary all the way from year seven up to year 11. And when I got to year nine, I was just disgusted with myself. Year seven and eight, I seemed like a nice girl. Year nine, gosh, I was just like, who is this person? It's just kind of a stage you go through like when you're like 14. <laughs> you do, don't you, completely with it. Now I agree with you, so, but that one. So and I said, it's nice way. I think that's part of the, the part of right, joy writing sometimes. It's a lot of it's reflection of tremendous stuff. Anyway, Louise, I think we we better wrap up here now because we're going to be here all night of wise. And I'm, I'm I'm conscious of that at the moment for you as well. So I want to thank you today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, Andy, thank you so much for inviting me. I've absolutely loved it, and I've loved listening to some of your other podcasts as well. I was having to listen to another one today. I only I only read listened to it for ten minutes, and I was like, I'm going to save this till I'm in bath because I quite like listening to the bath. So thanks, <laughs> yeah. Andy. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So anyway, guys and girls, that's it for today from another episode of Spoken Label. Stay tuned. We we're back before you know it. And as Don Carlos at Impact Wrestling always says, stay safe, and most importantly, stay over. I'll see you all soon. Spoken Label.